Hello there. Welcome to today's lesson, Sun's lesson about uh, the solid, liquid, and gaseous states of matter. In our previous lesson, we talked about uh, in length the properties of uh, solids, liquids, and gases, where we went even further to look at uh, some uh, coded information which we use the known information from what we had learned to decode the information. And at the end of the lesson, I gave out an assignment on a leaflet that was flying and was carrying a coded information that students were supposed to decode the information immediately as an assignment. So I would like us to start with the assignment look at the coded information and decode it using the letters we had already identified. I hope you worked on it. <clears throat> this is the information which was mysterious, flying around, and the students in the science class were asked to decode the information. So going by the letters as we had decoded from the previous assignment, using the general information of the kinetic theory of matter and the states of matter of uh, the two uh, the three states of matter we discover that the first word here is uh, hello hello that is uh, from the decoded information so getting the really meaning is hello earthlings so this uh, information was starting with their greeting, whereby they were greeting those who are living on the earth. It went further after the full stop. Greetings from the planet. Greetings. This one, if you decode it, that is greetings. And this one is from the planet. Zenos. Greetings from the planet. Greetings from the planet Zenos. So seemingly this piece of paper was carrying an information not from our planet Earth. It was coming from a different planet which from the decoded information the name of the planet is Zenos. It will further went on telling us that uh, we notice. So those in that planet Zenos notice something. So notice that we notice that. So they had noticed that you have you have polluted your atmosphere so much. So we notice that you have polluted your atmosphere so much. Your atmosphere so much. So looking at it again, this is a very important information to all of us. It is reminding us something that we should not be polluting our environment. But how do they come out to realize that we had polluted the atmosphere. Let's continue and see what the information is telling us. So it goes further and says that we cannot survive in it. 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 So which means any polluted environment is a hazard to us who are polluting it. As much as you may pollute it knowingly or unknowingly, but a polluted environment is dangerous to all of us and we are living dangerously on earth because of our pollution and we have to change our ways. Let's continue and see. It goes further and says, soon you will not also. 
So seemingly, what we have done here on Earth, on planet Zenos, it is now unbearable. And these organisms are not able to survive in that planet, the ones that have, that have sent this information. And it is just warning us that, or the, those organisms are warning us that, we shall soon also not be able to survive on this planet Earth that we shall have polluted as we are doing. So, as a point of advice, you must stop burning fossil fuel. These organisms from this new planet, Zonas, they are advising us. We need to stop burning fuel, uh, fossil fuel. Fossil fuel is the common petrol, diesel, and the likes, which is the most common fuel as the gas we are using in our machines, vehicles, and so on. So we need to change our ways. We need to look for other alternative ways to make our machines run and not just to depend on fossil fuel. When you burn a fossil fuel, you produce carbon four oxide, which can also be called carbon dioxide. Carbon four oxide, if you are using IUPAC way of naming, which is the most recommended, but you can also call it a carbon dioxide. Carbon four oxide. Carbon four oxide. This shows that <coughs> the oxidation number in this molecule of carbon is four. So that's why it is called carbon four oxide. But previously we used to just call it carbon dioxide, meaning we have one carbon and two oxygen in this. In addition to this, we also, during complete combustion, we also get water. In this product, the most dangerous substance is carbon four oxide, which causes so many other effects being a greenhouse gas. Being a greenhouse gas, it causes a greenhouse effect, which leads to global warming which is making our earth temperature to be rising causing so many problems like the effect of of a tsunami like el nino and the likes so that is the answer to our sign uh, to uh, the assignment i gave you in our previous lesson and the notice is very important to us it is a good reminder Let's follow what we have been advised to make sure that our earth is safe. <clears throat> now, after looking at all this story about kinetic theory of matter, about uh, the properties and behaviors of solids, properties and behavior of liquids, properties and behaviors of gases, Something must come in our mind. How did the whole of this story come about? How did it begin? Who are the masterminds of the whole of this story to do with the kinetic theory of matter? This theory is applied in so many areas of our lives, both directly and indirectly, for those who know it and for those who don't know it. But all in all, we need to realize that in everything, you also need to know the history about it. So I would like us to look at the history on how various scientists developed the story about kinetic theory of matter, which is an important theory in our life. As I've said, I want us to look at the history of the kinetic theory of matter. To start with, we shall start with a scientist by the name Democritus, who existed in the 15th century. This scientist came out with an idea that, or proposed that, 
matter is made up of small tiny indivisible units called atoms small tiny indivisible these small units which make up the matter whether it is in solid state liquid state or gas state he called the small unit an atom and of which in our present science lessons in chemistry we learn that it is true the smallest unit of an element is an atom which can easily be defined as an atom as the smallest particle of an element that can uh, can take part in a chemical reaction and cannot be divisible any further so you cannot divide it any further and it takes part in a chemical reaction this came from a scientist by the name Democritus maybe just to have a list of all the, of some of the scientists that have looked at that assist us in developing the theory the list is as follows as i had said earlier that uh, is good always to know the history on how something developed what we are looking at today is uh, a kinetic theory of matter properties of solids liquids and gases and uh, the following scientists are among the so many that uh, were heavily involved uh, in developing the present uh, day kinetic theory of matter that is very helpful in our life because uh, we commonly use it in, in our various uh, ways in the in various ways uh, particularly those that involve movement of particles so the first scientist here we are going to look at the 5th century BCE the scientist by the name Democritus these are scientists who notice that matter as we call it which that is the, the solids the liquids and gases matter it is made up of small tiny particles that are indivisible and these small tiny particles he named them atoms and indeed it is true atoms are the smallest particle of an element that can take part in a chemical reaction so as early as 5th century Democritus was good enough to notice that surely an atom is a very small particle and it is the one that makes the smallest particle of any matter that we interact with Robert Boyle is a scientist that related pressure of a gas and its volume pressure of a gas and its volume which is still being applied up to today in our previous lesson you remember we looked at a bicycle pump filling being used to fill a tire the principle behind that is what you call robert boyle's law commonly called as boyle's law relating pressure and the volume of a gas how if you look at a bicycle pump when you pull the piston up you increase the volume of the pump and in the process you reduce the pressure in the pump so this one makes the air to rush in because there is a free space created you have increased the volume you reduce the pressure when you push in the piston you reduce the volume in the pump as a result you increase the pressure which now makes it to push now the air particles into the tire as you continue filling up the tire so that is a very good explanation accounting for our kinetic theory of matter as we know it today 
it was done in 1660 by Robert Boyle. Relative pressure and volume of a gas. Our next scientist is Daniel Panuli. <coughs> you can uh, attest to this. This uh, a scientist who came up with uh, one of uh, the best ideas in terms of kinetic theory of matter, though he didn't directly connect it to kinetic theory of matter. But as you look at it in terms of how he was explaining it, then you discover that it has a direct linkage to kinetic theory of matter. These are the man behind the lifting of objects due to speed and streamlined bodies. Look at a plane. How does a plane lift itself from the ground as heavy as it is? Everything is hidden in the shape of the plane. Everything is hidden in the movement of matter around the plane. And that is what Daniel Panuli came up with. When a plane is moving, on top of it and at the bottom, air moves but at different speeds. So at the top, which is streamlined, Remember at the bottom still the tires will be there and all that obstructing, but air at the top will be moving very fast. By so doing, it creates a low pressure at the top. And at the bottom, still there is high pressure when the plane has acquired a certain speed. This is the matter that is moving on top of that plane as it is streamlined. On top of that plane, it is air moving, but air is matter, matter in a gaseous state. So it is, as it moves eh, very fast, creates a low pressure, which is eh, in a comparison to the lower point. This makes now the plane to lift itself as it flies. And there is no way it can continue creating the same when it stops. So it has to continue moving so that it makes sure that the upper part, low pressure, the lower point, high pressure, so that it is maintained in a lifted position. That is the work of Daniel Panulis. The fourth scientist here is Jackie Charles. Jackie Charles, Charles and Boyles had some small connection. They all talked about a volume of a gas. Boyles talked about a volume of a gas in relation to pressure. But Charles related volume of a gas to temperature, which we still apply up to today. You remember in our previous lesson, we talked about a vehicle moving on maybe a sunny hot day, a very long journey. Remember this is a tarmac road, black in color, has absorbed a lot of heat. What will happen to the tire? We said that the tire increases in size. And yet, there is no addition of any gas particles or any gas in the tire. It still maintains the amount of gaseous particles it had previously. But how comes the tire increase in size? The answer was the heat energy being absorbed by the tire from the around, from the surrounding, that's the road, and the air, which is hot, the particles now gained more kinetic energy, more collisions, more heating of the walls, which is the tire creating high gas pressure, increasing the size of the tire. If it exceeds the elastic limit of the tire, then the tire can burst. That explains Charles' law. This tells us, uh, tells us that as you increase temperature, you increase volume. And as you reduce temperature, you reduce the volume. 
This is the opposite of Boyle's law, which told us that as you increase pressure, you reduce volume. You increase pressure, you reduce volume. You reduce pressure, you increase volume. So this one is directly opposite. Pressure, if it goes high, volume goes down. But for Charles law, temperature goes high, volume goes high. Temperature goes down, volume also goes down. So they are directly proportional. And the, the uh, Boyle's law is the opposite. So that is so much directly to do with the, our Charles uh, kinetic theory of matter, Charles law and Boyle's law. Our next scientist is Count Ramford. Count Ramford, a scientist that was so serious that he talked about a test of now the really kinetic theory of matter as we are talking about today. Looking at the others, they were just talking about aspects to do with it. But uh, Count Ramford is the one who took, uh, who took us uh, or who made a kind of a form, a direct form of kinetic theory of matter. So he becomes the first scientist to directly talk about uh, kinetic theory of matter. All these others, their aspects are directly linked, but they didn't mention kinetic theory of matter as it is. It's only that what they were talking about is in line with the kinetic theory of matter. But Count Ramford was the first scientist to directly talk about kinetic theory of matter. However, he wasn't so much in a, de a detail of it. The next scientist is Gay Lussac. Gay Lussac is commonly applied in um, chemistry. His principle is seriously, mainly applied in chemistry, whereby he talks about the number of particles in relation to volume. The number of particles in relation to volume. To him, a particular volume, so long as it's maintained, the number of particles in that volume should always be the same. This one comes about because of if the temperature and the pressure is maintained, then there is no way whether you are up in the sky, on the ground, the number of particles should vary. And it is Gay-Lussac who came up with that aspect. Gay-Lussac is directly also his work and the next scientist, Amedeo Avogadro, they are almost line in line with each other. Because they also talk about, uh, Avocado also talks about the number of particles of a substance or of that matter in a particular volume. However, he now puts in another aspect of temperature and pressure, such that he is a little bit more advanced on Gay Lussac, though they are talking about the same thing because he is infusing in another aspect of temperature and pressure. Because remember, up here we have talked about Boyle's law and Charles law, where we have seen temperature can affect, pressure can also affect. So here, Avogadro is coming to fuse in the temperature and the pressure as you look at the number of the particles in that particular volume of that particular substance. In fact, Avogadro's statement comes in as a constant, which we commonly call as Avogadro's constant, which tells us that in any particular amount of 
matter. That's any substance which is matter. Any particular amount of matter, that substance. At particular temperature, which is a constant, particular pressure, which is a constant, the amount of small particles in it should be constant. It doesn't matter whether it is a liquid, a gas, or a solid. What is important is let the substance be a constant at a particular constant temperature, at a particular constant pressure, then the small amount of particles, the small number of particles making that particular substance should be the same in number. From Avogadras, we have our next scientist, John Harafad. This is now the scientist who added some substance on Count Ramford. To him, what Ramford did was a little bit less advanced. So to him, he added in the issue of now energy. In the energy, energy is in terms of temperature. So he looked at movement of particles. How do they move? Is there another thing that could be affecting movement of particles? And the answer is yes, temperature. Increase in temperature has a direct bearing on the kinetic energy. The only thing he also ran short of was to connect kinetic energy and temperature. These two things are like twins, kinetic energy and temperature, but they are different. Maybe to try and show how they can be explained in, to show that they are different, kinetic energy is like a vehicle moving. But for a vehicle to move, you need a fuel. And the fuel is now the temperature. But it doesn't mean that temperature, which is now fuel, temperature, which is fuel, if you don't put in that temperature, if you don't move in, put in that fuel, the vehicle will not move. But in other circumstances, it can move, going by other different conditions, which we may not be looking at at the moment. But for now, we are looking at temperature as an aspect that causes the particles to move. More high temperature, more movement. Less temperature, less movement. Just like more fuel, as you are accelerating your vehicle, more fuel, high speed. Less fuel, less speed. The other one is Robert, uh, Robert Brown. Robert Brown, I mentioned him earlier in uh, our previous lesson, where we were talking about uh, the Brownian motion. This is the scientist who came out to show the random movement of matter, particles, particularly in the gaseous state, and which will, uh, gaseous state, which is also reflected in a liquid state. He used the pollen grains in water using a microscope, and he saw that in that water, pollen grains were moving in a very zigzag manner which he later explained that by looking at it in terms of the pollen grains being small and light, being bombarded, being heat, colliding with the water molecules. By so doing, the pollen grains were moving in a zigzag manner. We further looked at it in terms of using maybe a beam of light in a smoky room, just to emphasize on how Brown, uh, brown and motion can be understood. So in a beam of light, if you have a smoke cell or even just in an open room that has a direct beam of light, under that beam of light, you will see that specks 
or smoke will be glittering as they move randomly around. That is uh, happening because uh, the smoke particles, just like the pollen grains, are being bombarded, are colliding with the air particles, just like uh, pollen grains colliding with the water molecules, making them to move in a zigzag manner, which we commonly call uh, Brownian motion, which came from the, uh, the name Brown. Brownian motion. So he is, uh, I can call him the father of Brownian motion. But Brownian motion is just a kinetic theory of matter, indirectly. How? Brownian motion is talking about particles moving in a zigzag manner. Who is causing that? We go to kinetic theory of matter, we get to understand that in a kinetic theory of matter, particles move because they have the energy. So these pollen grains were moving because they have energy. When they collide with the water, it's like the kinetic theory of matter Particles colliding with each other or with the walls. So, indirectly, he was talking about kinetic theory of matter, though at that point he was talking about Brownian motion. The next one is Lord Kelvin. Lord Kelvin is a scientist who now came in with another scale of temperature, commonly called as Kelvin scale. He was disturbed with the common scale that was being used at the time. That is the Celsius scale. In the Celsius scale, we understand that at zero degrees centigrade, we expect everything to be zero. But that is not the case. Because at zero degrees centigrade, people still are still living. They can still breathe, which means that air which has the oxygen that is important in our breathing system, is still in the gaseous state. It's not zero. So many other gases are not zero. So he had now to look for his own zero. And to him, zero meant everything is zero. And he came up with the Kelvin scale where zero Kelvin is negative 273 degrees centigrade, that's Celsius scale, which is a very low temperature. So at that temperature, which we call absolute zero, given as by Lord Kelvin, absolute zero, that is negative 273 Celsius scale, it is assumed most of the substances matter that is existing at that, at that point is zero by volume. So giving us a projection of So if this is the line to show a projection of volume, and this is in a Celsius scale, you will go past at this point, which is zero degrees centigrade. Where to him, he wanted at that point, everything to be zero, but it wasn't that way. As I've just said, in so many parts of this world, this earth, you will find that temperatures will go to less than zero degrees centigrade, but animals will continue living. Why? They are breathing. Oxygen is still as a gas, and so many other gases. So it didn't work. So his scale, which is the Kelvin scale, moved past the zero degrees centigrade, which at this point, as you can see, the volume is not zero. So he looked for a point where volume will be zero. This is a volume. Volume is this volume. So this volume, which can go as high or can go as low. So at this point on this line, which is the x-axis, 
volume is zero. And now this line which is talking about volume of any particular matter, it can be a gas, can be anything, but mostly we talk about gases. It can move from as much as maybe 20 cubic centimeters, which have a hundred, a million, but as you reduce the temperature to negative 73 degrees centigrade, the volume becomes zero. And it is at this point that Lord Kelvin called it zero Kelvin. Where matter, all matter, will be carrying zero volume. He didn't talk about kinetic theory of matter directly. But still, looking at it, it is coming in hand in hand with the others to explain so much to do with the kinetic theory of matter because it is talking about temperature in relation to volume, just like Charles Law. Temperature in relation to volume. So you will find that in most cases, Kelvin scale, Charles Law, they will always be used together because Charles Law is talking about temperature and volume and also Lord Kelvin, in his coming up with the, the, cell, uh, the Kelvin scale, he was looking for zero Kelvin, which is temperature. And the temperature in relation to volume of the particular of matter he was talking about. The next scientist is uh, Rudolf uh, Clausius. Rudolf Clausius is a scientist who in his uh, study went further and now gave us almost our current kinetic theory of matter. He looked at what uh, Count Ramford did. Then he also looked at what uh, John Herafath did and combined. On combining, he discovered that to Ramford, his was to do with the kinetic energy. But uh, looking at uh, Herafath, his was to look at temperature as uh, the engine. Herafath Temperature was the engine. Ramford, it was kinetic energy. All of them have a limitation. Because as I've just explained earlier, there is no way you can delink kinetic energy and temperature. There is no way you can delink fuel from a moving, a moving vehicle. No fuel, no movement of the vehicle. So that came in very well with uh, Rudolf, who now saw it uh, fit that we need the two combined and see how matter in behaves in relation to how much energy in terms of temperature and how much does it move. That is uh, the kinetic energy that makes it move. So Rudolf can be like the father of the present kinetic theory of matter that we presently use. He combined both the temperature, which is important, and the kinetic energy of the particles, which is also important, that the two can, should always work together. The next scientist, after our good Rudolf, who has given us now what we are discussing right now, is uh, Lord is Ludwig Boltzmann. Ludwig Boltzmann. And Boltzmann now didn't look at it in terms of a kinetic theory of matter as a statement. Remember, Rudolf 
looked at it as a statement that kinetic energy, temperature, which is heat energy, go hand in hand in describing kinetic theory of matter. But Ludwig Boltzmann looked at it as an equation. An equation here becomes a little bit more advanced because you have to look at different situations. An equation can deal with the different situations. A statement will only put everything into one container, which is not the case. Because each gas has its own properties. Each matter has its own properties. But looking at what Ludwig did, looked at it in terms of an equation where he saw it fit that an equation can be able to explain some of the misfitting information when it comes to a statement. Just like if we can go back to the Kelvin scale, Lord Kelvin. As much as he discovered the zero Kelvin, it is not a hundred percent agreeable that all substance at negative 273 degrees centigrade, what we call absolute zero or zero Kelvin, that that substance will be zero by volume. No. We have those that will go against that. But a majority may agree with it. So the same to Boltzmann. He looked at it that an equation can at least solve more questionable areas and like what uh, Rudolf was doing with the, the statement. Later on, a scientist by the name Einstein Albert came in and looked at it, uh, the, the movement of particles as in terms of what we saw in a Brownian motion. Robert Brown movement. Robert Brown told us that the pollen grain was moving. And why? Being hit by water molecules. And that was all. But now, Albert Einstein comes in and discovers, no, it is not just that. Energy comes in. It is this pollen grain, this water molecule, must be having some energy that is making it move so that they can collide. And when they collide, now they cause that zigzag movement that we call Brownian motion. So as you can see, he called that movement Brownian motion with, in respect to Robert Brown because he knew it was already there. But he only added in the aspect of energy because there's no way a particle can move without energy. Just as we used a vehicle as an example, there's no way that vehicle can move without the power of the fuel. And the more the fuel, as you accelerate, the faster the movement of the vehicle. And the less the fuel, the less the speed. So that was Albert Einstein, who again further, in 1966, after around 90, uh, 11 years, he also came up with an equation now. Now this equation, he looked at it in terms of the atom the energy levels the atom has. Each energy level has electrons. These electrons carry different amount of energy. So, in his study, he discovered that there was movement in an atom. And because of that, he called it a spectra. Spectra. Spectra is a emission of light caused by movement. To try to understand that aspect of spectra as given by Albert Einstein in 1966, look at a situation whereby you have an atom. This is the nucleus. This is the first energy level. And this is the second energy level. When an electron 
is on this outer energy level it means it has some particular more energy particular more energy that's why you are higher or outer in case you lose the energy you go down and going down means you move to the inner energy level but when you are moving to the inner energy level which has less energy any extra energy you were carrying when in the outer or upper part must be given out and it is normally given out as a flash of light which was described as a spectra so you will find that so many atoms so many atoms give out different types of spectra and this gives rise to what we call flame test in a flame test a process used in identifying different types of uh, metallic atoms we use spectra to show which metal is which because each metal as the electron moves from the outer energy level to the lower one it gives a characteristic light in terms of color which will be used in identification then lastly we have sydney chapman and david enson these two scientists polished on what our ludwig boltzmann rudolf Kloss did giving us now the most current kinetic theory of matter these are not the only scientists we also have others but they are the ones who mainly contributed to coming up with the kinetic theory of matter and after albert einstein and sydney chapman we also have other scientists who have now used mathematical expressions mostly mathematical expressions mostly to explain the kinetic theory of matter and they, in their mathematical expressions they describe the behavior of matter in respect to what is making that matter or the particle in that particular matter because matter is of a different property solid liquid gas but it can still be a liquid but of a different property that is all about our history on how the kinetic theory of matter was developed